On the 4th of November 2010, a Qantas Airlines Airbus A380 Flight 32 stopped at the Singapore Changi Airport to refuel en route to Sydney Airport in Australia. 469 passengers and crew members were on board the regularly scheduled flight, which had departed from London Heathrow as usual. The flight up until that point had gone smoothly and was only seven and a half hours away from Sydney. However, just moments after the plane had departed, something unexpected happened that threatened to claim the lives of everyone on board. This is the story of Flight 32's engine explosion that almost resulted in utter devastation. The day of Qantas Flight 32 was unremarkable. The weather was fine, checks were completed on the aircraft, which had safely landed in Singapore from London some hours earlier, was all but ready to go to Sydney as had been done multiple times before. The aircraft in question was a two-year-old Airbus A380. It was also known as the Nancy Bird Walton. In fact, this aircraft was the first of six Airbus A380s delivered to Qantas in 2008. The Airbus A380 is still the largest commercial jet back then. It was seen as the peak of innovation, safety and reliability in the aviation sector. However, what was about to happen in a few minutes would cast doubt on its capabilities. With the 440 passengers aboard the aircraft was a crew of 29, including a rather surprising number of pilots, five in total. As most of you know, most flights usually have two pilots. The main pilot, who for this flight was Captain Richard Champion de Crespigny, and the first officer, as well as a flight engineer in the cockpit. But Qantas Airlines also had a Czech captain under training as well as his supervisor. So, while the number of people in the cockpit shouldn't inherently be an issue, the job of the Czech captain to assess the performance of the pilots means the presence could possibly cause some misunderstanding in the cockpit. The 53-year-old captain was experienced, having worked with the Australian Air Force and logged in around 15,000 hours of flying time. But most of his flying experience had been clocked on the Boeing 747 and the Airbus A330 with less than 10 hours coming on the A380. The first officer, on the other hand, had 11,000 hours of flight experience. And while not generally as experienced as the captain, he had over twice the flying experience on the A380, clocking over 20 hours. All this experience would be put to the test soon after takeoff. At around 9.45 that morning, following refueling, the massive aircraft pushed back from the gate at Singapore, with the 440 passengers settled in for the flight to Sydney to take off at 9.56 a.m. Captain de Crespigny lined the aircraft up on the runway and pushed the four Rolls-Royce engines to take off thrust. For a couple of minutes after takeoff, everything seemed calm. The aircraft climbed over the Singapore Strait, accelerating to around 460 kilometers per hour. However, as the plane passed through to 7,000 feet altitude, it was suddenly shaken by two loud bangs. The second engine, situated on the aircraft's left side, suffered an explosion, causing debris to penetrate the left wing and fuselage. Almost immediately, jet fuel began gushing out from under the wing, right beside the heated engine, a potential recipe for disaster. The captain's quick reaction to this was to stop the plane's ascent. However, the crew were ignorant of the reality of the situation and the extent of the damage which the engine had caused to the rest of the aircraft. Hot shards of metal had exploded out from the engine and penetrated part of the aircraft fuselage. With this, and due to the aircraft's supersonic speed, bundles of electrical wiring that fed a number of aircraft systems had also been severed. These included the flight controls, fire protection, hydraulic power and more. The Qantas captain tried to establish control and instructed the first officer to begin working through the checklists which were now displaying on the ECAM. At this point, the atmosphere in the cockpit was tense but calm. They were, however, about to realize the full extent of the engine failure. Suddenly, a column started displaying warning messages for systems which had nothing to do with the engines. Something had clearly gone terribly wrong. Unlike the cockpit crew, the passengers sitting at the left-hand side of the aircraft were able to see all that happened, including the holes in the wing which had been punctured by the engine shards. They too were able to get a good look at the fuel gushing out from underneath the wing. 
As signs of considerable damage began to emerge, the ECAM displayed worrying messages such as the engine 2 turbine overheating and stalling. In reality, however, the engine turbine was all but destroyed and the crew shut down the engine before alerting air traffic control to their predicament. With an engine fire possible, the pilots tried unsuccessfully to discharge one of the two engine fire extinguishers. Unknown to them, the engine's fire suppression system had also been cut off. With gallons of fuel streaming out from a leakage beside the engine, the last thing they needed was an engine fire. The situation was now getting critical. Down below, on the island of Batam, just south of Singapore, large pieces of engine debris had started raining down from the sky, causing damage to buildings and cars. The Qantas logo was even visible on some of the wreckage leading to rumours that a Qantas aircraft had just crashed. Back in the aircraft, passengers faced the very real possibility that they wouldn't make it back to Singapore. At this point, the Airbus A380 had experienced such a complex set of failures that it would have been difficult for either of the pilots to make any sense of it. Qantas headquarters saw the warning messages from the plane but struggled to contact the crew as the aircraft's satellite communication system had also been severed. It appeared that the pilots were on their own. Added to their troubles was that none of the three remaining engines were operating optimally. Engines 1 and 4 went on degraded mode and engine parameters were not available to the pilots. Engine 3, meanwhile, was in what is known as an alternate mode but appeared to be in better condition than the other two engines. The pilots were faced with a difficult decision on whether to immediately return to Singapore or spend more time fixing their problems out over the ocean. Both options had their risks. Thus, the five crew members had to carefully weigh up their options. More time on air meant they risked further damage being done to the plane either by loss of fuel, hydraulic fluid or electrical systems. On the other hand, if they decided to land immediately, there was no telling how the aircraft would behave during descent. The decision that was made was that the risks of returning immediately were greater than the risks of troubleshooting for longer, as the plane was somewhat controllable with plenty of fuel on board. They then told air traffic control that they would need some time to go through the ECAM messages and associated procedures and asked to enter a holding pattern somewhere. Captain de Crespigny was eager to stay within gliding distance of Singapore just in case more engines failed, and this was relayed to the controller who cleared them to hold out over the ocean to the east of Singapore. Despite overcoming dozens of warnings concerning the engines, the aircraft's hydraulic systems would provide more headaches. The pilots received indications that one of the aircraft's two hydraulic systems was losing all of its fluid. What made the situation worse was that Engine 3 was the only one providing hydraulic power to the only working hydraulic system, and its failure would have surely spelt doom. At this point, the pilots decided to take a look at the damage for themselves to better understand the gravity of things. One possibility was for the pilots to pump some fuel to make the aircraft as light as possible for landing. The explosion, however, had also damaged the aircraft fuel management system which meant that they were unable to do this. This resulted in the already heavy aircraft being 50 tons overweight for landing and also now becoming lopsided. The considerable fuel loss from the left-hand wing meant it was now almost 10 tons lighter than the right-hand wing and the imbalance was getting worse with every passing minute. With the crew now getting a better picture of the damage, it was now time to land the aircraft but the excess fuel added to its current condition made landing decisions even more complex than they already were. The crew attempted to use the landing performance application to assist with the landing parameters. However, with so many simultaneous malfunctions, the system could barely cope. It was up to each member of the cockpit crew to contribute their estimates on the situation based on past experience. This would prove fortunate for everyone on board. According to the computer, they would need to carry out their approach 35 knots faster than normal. This further increased their landing distance, and while they were able to stop on the runway, the computer said they would stop with just 130 meters to spare on the 4,000 meter long runway. Anything but precision flying from the captain would result in a runway overrun, and that's not all. Because even if the crew got everything right, 
there was still a chance that they would go off the end of the runway since the computer merely provided an estimate of their landing distance. The pilots hoped that their landing distance calculations would be correct and if they would be able to control the plane once it touched down and guarantee the lives of nearly 480 people on board. Before turning back towards the airport, the pilots tested if the plane could be properly controlled on approach but realized it reacted quite sluggishly. Their response was to alter some approach parameters, then painstakingly extend the gears and set engine 3 to control the plane's approach speed. The plane was now set up for landing and lined up with the runway. Soon after, the aircraft touched down at high speed. The captain quickly slammed on the brakes using maximum manual braking and put engine 3 into reverse thrust as the plane continued gliding down the runway. With the end of the runway fast approaching, the massive plane began to slow down. It finally came to rest just 150 meters from the runway's end. Then, a new, potentially more dangerous problem arose. The left wing was still spewing fuel which was now spreading beneath the aircraft and getting close to the scorching 900 degrees Celsius brakes. If the fuel came in contact with the hot brakes, a fire could break out. Added to this was the warning from the fire brigade that engine one was still running. The crew tried to shut it down, but were failing and the engine was stuck on high power, while three tons of jet fuel spread out across the runway. Captain de Crespigny now only had two options, to order the passengers to evacuate or to keep them on board with the risk of a massive fuel explosion. The crew weighed up their options and decided to keep all passengers on board but prepare them for an evacuation in case a fire erupted. Fire service eventually arrived and began spraying the fuel beneath the aircraft with fire retardant. Thirteen minutes after the aircraft had touched down, the crew finally had the passengers disembark via an air stairs on the right-hand side of the aircraft. Due to issues with communication, the air stairs only arrived 20 minutes later along with buses to gradually shuttle all 440 passengers to the airport terminal. The number one engine stays running three hours after landing until fire service eventually managed to stop it by drowning it with fire retardant foam. Despite the potential for disagreement due to the amount of crew members in the cockpit, the pilots all displayed remarkable teamwork and decision making, which led to their heroics being described as one of the finest examples of airmanship in the history of aviation. The captain was even awarded the Order of Australia for his incredible flying and professionalism in an emergency. But the main question to be asked was what had caused the quite remarkable engine failure of Qantas Airbus A380 in the first place and how a new aircraft with such a clean record could come so close to disaster. What investigators from the ATSB found was that the fault had come from a leak caused by a fatigue cracked lubrication oil feed line used for bearings inside the engine. Apparently, the leaking oil had auto-ignited and destroyed seals, letting hot turbine gas into potentially dangerous spaces. The gas easily cut through parts of the engine and resulted in the turbine spinning out of control until a turbine disc shattered due to the rotational forces and sent hundreds of fast-traveling pieces of shrapnel exiting the engine casing and thankfully not penetrating into the passenger cabin. This occurrence is what is called a non-contained engine failure and should naturally never occur. The root cause of this fault was found to be a manufacturing defect in the oil pipes from Rolls-Royce, the engine's manufacturer who claimed a misaligned counterbore was the cause of the fire. As a result, inspections were carried out on all A380s which had the Trent 900 engine with some pipes quickly replaced. Rolls-Royce was forced to pay Qantas around $100 million in compensation. Following these inspections, 53 of these engines were removed from service, and there hasn't been another similar incident on the A380. The aircraft involved in this incident was repaired at a cost of $145 million, with all four engines and the left wing changed and is still flying with Qantas today. So there you have it the story of Qantas Flight 32 and how the brave and smart pilots avoided a disastrous outcome for hundreds of passengers. What are your thoughts on their heroics as well as Rolls-Royce's engine problems?
please let us know in the comments below. Until next time, take care.